Good evening. Welcome to Guest Road Baptist Church Midweek Prayer Meeting Bible Study. I'm Pastor Dan Tilly, the Senior Pastor at Guest Road Baptist Church. We're glad to have you joining us this evening. I invite you to be a part of all of our services. They're all online, different times. You can find that information on the website. Sunday morning, we are inside and outside and online. What we mean by that is you can come in at 1030 and uh, be a part of the service there, or you can be in the parking lot and listen to it on the radio, or you can watch us online. But we encourage you to join us, us for <clears throat> all of our services on Sunday morning. Uh, Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. Uh, the 28th, that morning, we will have a special service, a cantata, uh, put on by part of our choir. Uh, so we encourage you to come be a part of that and uh, uh, be, uh, participate in that because it will be a wonderful time of celebrating Easter and also a time of uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. So I invite you to be a part of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this evening. Father, thank you for this time, this day, this blessed time of being with you and with one another, dear Father. We know we cannot always be together, but Father, we know that you are in our midst no matter what. And so as we gather, we know we're gathering in the name of Jesus. We pray your blessing upon this time. And Father, we ask this for your glory. And in the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Each week we put out a prayer sheet and that prayer sheet is received by email. Um, you're welcome to sign up for that. Uh, you can make additions or ask for a copy of it by going to our uh, website and uh, uh, connecting to the proper link there and uh, that information will be shared. You can also share uh, a prayer request publicly or privately there. We don't read the prayer list on Sunday on Wednesday, Wednesday nights online because some of the people that names are there uh, do not wish for their personal information to be shared publicly there. So we do not share all the names, but we do encourage you to pray for revival and for uh, the church and for believers, for lost souls, for missionaries, for um, our churches and their staff. We pray, I uh, encourage you to pray for our nation and we pray uh, pray, pray for our elected officials and public servants and uh, such as that. Uh, also our school children in uh, our schools and the pandemic and those who are rest home, nursing home, assisted living, our doctors and nurses, those part of the pandemic and all of those uh, uh, situations and circumstances that are arising and falling within humanity as a whole. We encourage you to pray for all of them. And of course, we certainly want to pray. I uh, encourage you to pray with a thankful heart unto God. Uh, Paul teaches us to pray with thanksgiving and to pray uh, with a time of praise um, there. Uh, Psalms 95 verse 2 says, let us come before his presence. That is a call to worship. And then it goes on to say, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. And that is an expression of gratitude. God blesses us beyond measure. And so we certainly want to be thankful to him in all that he does and gives to us. Um, I encourage you to uh, not only encourage you to have that thanksgiving this time of your prayer, but to praise God, to just give him adoration and adulation for who he is and all that he does for us there. With that said, uh, again, if you'd like to make a prayer request, you can do that online or you can call our church office there and, uh, and we'll be glad to do that. With all that information said, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time uh, for our evening prayer. Uh, our gracious Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are the only true God and that you are our God, dear Father, and that you provide for us through your power and grace. We acknowledge, dear God, our need for you, and we acknowledge, dear God, that we are able to love you because you first loved us. We are thankful for your blessings in our lives, for your gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the gift of your Holy Word, the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of prayer itself, and so many other blessings and promises that are ours by your hand. We are thankful, dear Father. Father, we do want to pray that you will be lifted up, that your name will be lifted up, that the name of Jesus will be lifted up to all men. For Father, when Jesus is lifted up, he can draw all men unto him. And revival will come and an awakening will come, dear Father, and lost souls will be saved. Each of us knows people who are lost, dear Father. May we be quickened in our heart by your Spirit to pray for them and pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them of sin, judgment, and righteousness and that we will share your love with them in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, to die in their stead. We pray for believers, dear Father, that we would grow in our Christ-likeness. 
Father, we pray for the church as a whole to fulfill your great command, the great commission. We pray for our missionaries as they are sharing the gospel in different locations. We pray, dear God, for our nation, our elected officials, our public servants, our, our people who are uh, striving and caring for our nation, our military, and such as that, dear Father. We pray for the pandemic and those that are sick and issues there. We do lift up those in nursing homes, assisted living, people who are homebound. We pray, dear God, for everyone who has a need in their life and ask you to bless them. Father, for those that have joined us by uh, viewing this uh, time tonight, we pray your blessings be upon each one of them. Pray you will encourage them and strengthen them and that we will all depend upon you and trust in you, dear Father. Father, as we go into our Bible study this evening, we pray you will give us an understanding and a wisdom of it, and it will help us to have a better understanding of who Jesus is. And it's in his name we do pray. Amen. This evening, we're going to continue on in our study of the Gospel of John uh, here, and we'll be coming to the third part of John's prologue, which is chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, and that section is entitled, Coming of the Light. Now, we have seen in the first five verses here uh, some extraordinary, uh, or chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 here, the first part of John's prologue. We have seen some extraordinary theological truths that John sets forth concerning Jesus. And then in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 1, there, the second part of John's prologue, we have seen that John the Baptist is a witness unto Jesus. Um, now, we have noticed that in all of these uh, truths here that are being set forth by John in his prologue, here, those five theological truths and the truth of John uh, the Baptist being a witness in him all point to Jesus as the Savior. Because if we will remember John's gospel's point, the purpose of his gospel writing is uh, to point to people to salvation, to be an evangelistic effort. And so we pointing to Jesus as the Savior is a fundamental thing. We've also noted that all, all these things that we're seeing here in John's prologue are truths that John is building his gospel as a whole upon. Now, as I've said, we're looking at the third part of it tonight, and this speaks about Jesus as the light, which we've already seen him as the light earlier, uh, coming unto mankind there. So let's look at our focal passage, John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believeth on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I hope and pray God will bless the reading of his word, and that we will have an understanding of it this evening. Now, First of all, I want to point out to you that I did not include verse 14 in our passage tonight talking about the light, about Jesus coming into the world, coming unto his creation. Um, I did not include verse 14, but verse 14 is actually one of the things that really teaches us and tells us that John did, I mean, that Jesus did come into the world. Listen to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he beheld, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that, of course, is pointing to the fact Jesus came as God incarnate, but it is here that John introduces the concept of God incarnate, God with man, being fully God and fully man there. And so it introduces that idea, and because that is such a relative and important true for us to grab we're going to deal with that next week verse 14 in and of itself so tonight we're only going to be looking at 9 through 13 which does reveal to us that jesus came as the light unto man and this is john's next theological truth so let's look at this theological truth look at verse 9 it says that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world now if we go back to verses 4 and 5 of, our, our, of John's prologue, which we studied a couple of weeks ago, we know that light here is speaking about Jesus, and we know that the phrase lighteth every man is speaking about Jesus shining uh, the light of God on man, on man's sin and on man's need for salvation and on how man can be brought into a right relationship with God. We've already seen these and we've studied these truths. So we will not rehash them 
this evening. But what we do need to take note of here when we look at uh, uh, what John is writing here and he says, lighteth every man, is John is not talking about universal salvation. For some reason or another, we have gotten into that spin uh, within Christianity, even some uh, Christian churches teaching that there is a universal salvation. No, salvation only comes to those who confess with their mouth and believe in the heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when it says he lighteth every man, he's saying he gives every man opportunity to be saved. It is not saying that every man will be saved just because Jesus came. He came to give man that opportunity to be saved. So what we see is here is that John is saying the light, who is Jesus, who shines on man, illuminating the sin that's in man's life, illuminating man's sin, a need for salvation, and illuminating how to be saved there, that man has that opportunity. He says that the light came into the world. John is saying here that the eternal, the Son of God, God himself, the creator, the life, the light, the one that John the Baptist testifies to. All those things that we've learned coming up to this point in John's prologue. He is saying that Jesus, who is all of those things there, has come into the world. And the word world here is the Greek word cosmos. It means the order of things. It's the created order of God. And so the light has come into the world. Now, the idea here is not that he just, boom, showed up and disappeared. The idea being expressed is that Jesus, as the light came, and he is staying, he is dwelling, he is tabernacling, as we've seen before those words there, with man. And he is coming to this his uh, uh, creation to enlighten all men. Because if you remember, we saw that Jesus is the Word, and that is, He is the Logos, and that means that He is the Word of God, the Revealer of God. So He is coming unto man as the Revealer of God unto man to reveal God unto man that man might have opportunity for salvation. Now, this is so unreligious. Most religions talk about man having to go to God. Here we're being told God is coming to man. He's coming to us. Here is the creator. We've seen Jesus as the creator. All things that were created were created by him. Nothing that was created he did was not created by him. And he is coming along, coming unto man. And as we're going to see next week in verse 14, he's going to come um, as the incarnate God, fully God, fully man, in the flesh, with us, dwelling with us. Now, as we've said all along in John's prologue, John makes these theological statements, these true statements about Jesus, but he does not defend them. He does not argue about them. He does not try to defend them. He does not try to prove them. He just states these, and he gives no discussion about them whatsoever, and so he is just presenting it as a fact. So here he is presenting a fact that Jesus, as the revealer of God, the word, the Logos, has come to man. He has come into the presence of man. But what John does tell us is two things. He tells us how Jesus was received in verses 10 and 11. And then he tells us what Jesus allows man uh, or empowers man to do or to become in verses 12 and 13. And these are key things because these relate to the truth, the fact that he did come. So the theological truth that Jesus, the light, which lighteth every man came into the world. Um, John tells us this is how he was received. And he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. There are specifically two groups of people being presented here, those who are in the world, those outside of God, uh, and uh, those who are his own, and those inside of God. This represents all of mankind. The world here that knew him not is the world of men, uh, the human society that is in disobedience to God. It is the uh, those who are under the rulership of Satan in this life and this way. His own 
born at this point in time was, of course, we're speaking to um, those who believed in Jesus and also the, uh, uh, those who were in the covenant relationship of the Jews more specifically there. there. And he says that each of these groups had a specific response to Jesus coming. First of all, this world, those who were not in relationship with God, knew him not. The second group, his own, those that should have known him, received him not. The world failed to recognize their creator. They failed to recognize him as their creator. They failed to recognize Jesus as all of those things that John has said that he was. But the uh, people of God, his covenant people, that says they received him not. Now, what that means is not so much that they did not recognize him, but it means that they did not accept him. They would not accept him as their savior. And if we think about that, it's not hard to understand how those who were in the world who are not a part of God uh, in any shape, form, or fa fashion uh, would not recognize Jesus as savior. That just sort of seems to go there. But what about God's own people, his covenant people, the Jewish nation that was looking for a savior? They were looking for the Messiah. And so when God sent him, they received him not. They rejected him there. Now, John doesn't argue this again. He doesn't just give us fact upon fact or reason upon reason for this uh, not recognizing Jesus and this not accepting Jesus. But if we were to go through the whole Bible, uh, especially in the New Testament, we could see how that those two statements are very true. Now, the second thing John gives us about this theological truth of Jesus coming uh, into his own creation, into this world, uh, is, is what he allowed man to become if man would accept him. It says, but as many as received him, and that could be translated as accepted him, to them gave him the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now notice something, but as many as received him, here again, we're talking about belief in Jesus. We're talking about not accepting Jesus as the revealer of God, accepting Jesus as the Savior of mankind there, those uh, who accepted him. So what we're seeing here is just as there's not universal salvation we talked about earlier, there's not universal rejection of Jesus, even though the world did not uh, recognize him in his own his covenant people did not uh, accept him there. It is not universal rejection of Jesus. Some actually received him. Some actually accepted him. Some believed in him and confessed him as their savior there. And when they accepted him, he allowed them or gave them the power to become the sons of God. This is talking about he gave them the power to be regenerated, to be reborn. This is the idea of the power to be brought back into and restored into a right relationship with God. Some speak about this as being brought into the family of God, becoming the children of God here. And they bring that idea in because it is this idea of birth. It is this idea of rebirth. It says, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man. So Jesus came and those that believed in him, he not only offered salvation to them, but he empowered them to be saved. He empowered them to be saved. So John is making this step from Jesus is the Savior to Jesus actually saved those who believed in him. And this is an important step in the building of John's gospel. Now, it is in this restored relationship that has been brought about by Jesus here that we need to understand that John says that this birth, this rebirth, doesn't take place because of a person's blood. That's referring to the blood uh, line or part of who they are. This is harking back to the Old Testament where the Jews were the God's chosen people. And if you were not a Jew, you could not come into a relationship with God. John says that's not true. He goes on and says that this birth, this rebirth, uh, doesn't take place because of natural law, the will of the flesh. The natural law of, of the flesh is that when couples have union and they um, uh, produce a child, that's just natural law. It didn't come out of a natural law. Uh, for man to be saved. And then he goes on and says it didn't even come out of a human desire. It is not man's desire to be saved. It says of the will of man. 
But what John does say is that this birth, this rebirth, took place because of the will of God. Now, here's a brand new concept for those who are uh, experiencing Jesus. And that brand new concept is, hey, God wants me to be saved. This has never before been seen or understood that God is pursuing and wanting. God came, said so he pursued, and God's wanting. This isn't because of who we are, our bloodline. This isn't because of natural law. This isn't because it's our will. It is the will of God that man will be saved. And so here is, is, is an, a, a, a great new expanse of understanding and theology being set forth by John to his readers here that has never been seen and never been understood before. And today we see these truths and we think about, well, that, yeah, we knew that. But do we see the power of it? Do we understand that, hey, here's God coming to us. Here's God coming to the world and the world not receiving him. Here's God coming to his own people and they reject him. Here's God coming. Why? Because he desires us to be saved. And here is God bringing about that salvation. He's not just saying this in theory that, that, that hey, yeah, you can be saved. John is stating, yeah, those who believed were saved a concrete understanding. And it's all because it is his will for us. So John is laying forth a very strong theological basis upon which he is going to build his gospel account about Jesus and, and, and Jesus being the Savior of mankind. Now, to help us fully grant, grasp what, what this significance of this is, that God came to earth to save men, let's just understand that this theological truth sets up the incarnation of God, verse 14. If he didn't come, it couldn't be God incarnate. If he wasn't the son of God, it couldn't be God incarnate. If he wasn't fully man, it couldn't be God incarnate. So that's setting up the incarnation of Christ. This same theological truth that Jesus says the light came and he came toward the redemption of man is setting up the cross. Because if he didn't come, he couldn't die on the cross. And if he couldn't die on the cross, then salvation couldn't be by grace. And so it's setting up that, that theological truth of the cross. This theological truth that Jesus came as the Logos, the revealer of God, and he came to man to redeem man, it sets up salvation by belief. If he didn't come as both God and man, if he didn't come and he go to the cross, how could we believe in him? It's setting that up. This same theological truth, Jesus is the light came, is not only setting up all of that, but it's setting up the very understanding that all men can be saved. Because up to this point, nobody could be saved other than God's chosen people, those there. But here's Jesus, and he opens it up to the Jews and the Gentiles. And all of that is being set up and built upon the simple truth, yet the powerful truth, that Jesus, as the light, the revealer of God came to his creation, to man, even though man rejected him, even though man would not receive him, the world and his own, he came with one purpose. And those who did receive him, did accept him, he enabled them, he empowered them to become the sons of God. And that was his will, to God's will for mankind. So again, we see John is building this great theological framework and this great theological stand, uh, stepping stone to stand upon for the truth of the gospel that he's building. And as we look at these theological truths here, the ones we have already seen, the one we've seen tonight and those that we'll see as we finish up uh, uh, John's prologue here, we need to not miss them. We need to get them and grasp them and understand them because it is on these truths that everything else that John is about to present here for the salvation of the lost and for our understanding of Christ is built upon. Now next week we're going to pick up at verse 14 and we're going to look at the truth of God incarnate there. And that again is talking about God coming. But there's a lot of things wrapped up in that being fully God, fully man, God with man dwelling, that tabernacle idea as we spoke of earlier there. So that's where we'll pick up in our study next week. I hope and pray that you understand God loves you, that God came to you, and he came in love 
offering you sonship unto him if you'll just believe in Jesus. If you're not saved, I pray you will be. If you are, I pray you will thank God for the blessing of salvation. We'll close with a word of prayer. God, thank you for the truth that Jesus came, that he came to us, that through him we might be saved. Father, let that reality sink in because it is a reality upon which so many things are built. And Father, without it, our gospel would fall apart. We thank you that the gospel cannot fall apart because of the truth of Jesus. Bless all, dear Father, of your people and all those in need, dear Father. And Father, encourage us all and give us opportunity to serve you. And may we seize those opportunities and may we seize them in love. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. God bless and have a wonderful evening.